Why was our guest mad at God for over five years? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Burrell, and I appreciate you joining us. And we have Jeff Walston here. I sure appreciate you coming and Glad to be here. sharing your story. It's just amazing to hear these transformative stories and uh, looking forward to hearing yours. As we usually do, where are you from? Where do you hail from? And I grew up in Moab. From? You did, born yep. there? Born there. Yep, I grew oh. up there. and. Uh, from there, went on my Mormon mission and returned there, met my wife, and yeah. so... How many people live in Moab? What's the population there? It depends on the week. Oh, <laughs> well, summer, of course, but... But it's about normal. six to 8,000. Is it? Yeah, okay. something like that. That's a neat... Permanent residence, I guess. Size and Mormon, quite Mormon, is it? It's not as Mormon as up here was uh -huh. growing up. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that was very much... It probably had 60%. There were there. some Gentiles there. Yes, or quite a few. As yep. we called them. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. Now, were your folks members of the church? And yes, my mother was a generational Mormon. Her her relatives came across with the Mormon pioneers. Uh -huh. My dad, dad's family, rather, they started, they joined the Mormon church when he was eight. Oh, so. And they were from Alabama. Okay. So my mother uh, grew up here in Spanish Fork. So did her ancestors... Uh, Settle Moab area? No, her that, ancestors oh, were up here in Spanish in Fork. In Spanish Fork, you right. just said that, yeah. sorry. And so yeah. she came from up here, yeah. and so there's a long... <laughs> brothers many, and sisters? How many do you have? Uh, there were there were seven brothers and sisters yeah. and in our family, and uh, one died when she was born, oh. and then I've had my older two sisters have passed, passed. Oh. as well. So it's not good to be a... As we get older, huh? <laughs> Gee, it's not hasn't been fun. My but. brothers have been fine. It's my sisters, not so much. Oh, so, <laughs> so just active in the church then, as you were growing up. Yeah, we're very active in the church. Every time, pretty much, the doors were open, we were there. Yeah. My family was entirely there. Uh, my all my brothers and sisters, except me, went to BYU. Oh, except you, huh? Yeah, except me. And then my little sister. We adopted, my mother, mother and father adopted a girl when oh. I was 15. Oh. And so she didn't go either, but, yeah. but the all the older ones, BYU, they all went huh? to BYU. So the church was a big part of your life. Absolutely. It? Yeah, that affects everything that you're doing. I mean, your whole life. Like you say, when the doors are open, you're there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Seminary, did you take seminary? We went to seminary uh, across the street, of course, from oh, the high school. The school, yeah. Yeah. And would go every day. I don't even know how often it was. I don't even remember now. But it wasn't. I don't think it was daily though. Yeah. But we went, did, you know, did the whole thing. I was a, a deacon, a priest, and worked my way up that way, and okay. an elder. One of my Mormon missions. Now you England. mentioned the Mormon yep. mission. Where'd you yeah. go? England. Oh, England. I was uh, Manchester and Birmingham. They switched boundaries, and I ended up switching between the two missions during the mission. During huh? the mission, yeah. Now you were mentioning earlier that something unique happened on your mission, and right. we didn't get a chance to follow up on that. What so happened? So when I was uh, when I was out about three months on my Mormon mission, the Mormon Church changed the all the missions to eighteen months. I remember that. Yeah, and was then, that because it, of the Vietnam War or something? Was no, it about that time? It wasn't. It wasn't. I, it wasn't that. Huh? There was no real justification for it other than you kind of making the, it. So you went from. And so, if you'd have been out more than six months, you got to choose whether you were doing eighteen or two to years. Two, but I hadn't been out the six months, and so I it was is. eighteen months. Oh, and it kind of was an interesting thing because my sister at the, at the time had been called to uh, the Bristol mission in England as well. Oh, wow. And so she was two years older than I was. Uh -huh. And so we both went out at the same time and came back at the same time. Yeah, because there's have always been 18 months, Correct. right? Oh, and so it was an unusual occurrence that we came back together yeah. as well as basically left Was that together. a good experience? And English speaking, of course, right. it, even though it was kind of foreign, but uh, English it's, speaking was... It's, well, it's quite, English, it's quite yeah. foreign, some of the words <laughs> and some of their accents are quite... Right. But yeah, it was, I guess that was the, the thing that started me uh, questioning my Mormon faith. Oh, really? Yeah, it was the Mormon. Your Mormon mission? Yeah. I went out, I was, a good, I was a good Mormon kid. I went out and I wanted to do the Lord's work and I wanted to work hard and I wanted to do the right thing. Yeah. And I felt I was out on my Mormon mission for the right reason. And 
I ended up with, I think it was a total of 16 different companions in 18 months. Well, that's, and yeah. what I found was the majority of them, there were some that were out for the right reasons earlier on because you have the senior ones there, the more likely to be. But most of the ones I had didn't want to be there. Really? They were either there because their girlfriend wouldn't marry them if they didn't go or their, or their parents it, demanded yeah. it that they go or it was the thing to do. And um, I remember one of my, when I was first out, I remember one of my senior companions for all we did all day long was tour around on our bicycles and go see stuff. We never banged on doors. Oh. We never. <laughs> How did you report to the mission? Person? He lied on everything. Oh, shoot. <laughs> That doesn't get you on a very good footing, does it? And so it was just, it, it was a, it was built up in my family, at least to be, it's going to be the biggest thing in your life ever. Yeah. And it's going to be, you're working straight for the Lord all the time. Yeah. And it'll be the most, ex best experience you'll ever have. And I get out there and it's not. There's all these guys don't want to be there. They're, you know, I tried to, while I was on my Mormon mission, I mean, I read through the Bible twice. I read through the Book of Mormon three times. I read, you know, and I tried to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the time they didn't. Sounds like you were the person the mission president thought, you know, I can send this problem missionary to, to Jeff or Elder Walston and uh, he'll kind of keep him on the straight and, and narrow for a while. Do you yeah. think you were a problem solver? For, I was for a bit. And yeah. At the same time, it was just, like I said, that was probably my first exposure to it's not what it really should be. Hmm. And so uh, I returned off my Mormon mission kind of in a state of, uh, I was just dissatisfied. Yeah. I really was. I was dissatisfied. Anything with what doctrinal? Uh, at, that I mean, point, at that point? At that point? Not really. There was not even. I mean, your testimony was that the church yeah, was true, right. sure, right? And yeah, Joseph it was Smith true, was a prophet, and he was a prophet, and, and and all that stuff. And it was the the one I call the boilerplate, which <laughs> testimony, <the> testimony, <laughs> right? You just you know yeah. everybody says the same things, yeah. you know, and and as you, as a kid, you're encouraged to say the same thing. Right. And fast and testimony meaning you're, yeah. you're encouraged to to yeah. do the same thing. Right. So I considered it that I get back off my Mormon mission. And I'll get to the point where I was mad at God for five years. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I get back off my Mormon mission, and uh, my I meet my wife. Okay, so my it's kind of an interesting story. My wife and her family grew up in Moab until she was eight, and then they oh. left Moab, and they lived really close to us. And so we grew up in the same ward. My wife and I. We grew up as young kids. As young kids. Oh. And then to And then they move away. They move away, but to make more matters more confusing, my my mother, the I had a, a sister that was born dead two years younger than me. And my wife is two years younger than I am. And so my mother saw her and kind of adopted her and her little sister. And they were over at my house all the time. Mm. And until she was seven. And then they left seven, eight. And then they left Moab. And I didn't see them, but my mother kept in contact with them through birthday cards and Christmas oh, yeah. cards and stuff like that. So I have my mission cut short 18 months, right? I, I get back on a Friday. And my wife-to-be, which I didn't know this at the time, <laughs> for the first time in probably 8 or 10 years, came to visit my mother the next day. Oh. She was there on the Saturday after I returned. And you had just gotten home. And I had just literally got home the day before. Oh my. And so she shows up and we get reacquainted and it's a it's a typical, of, I would consider typical of that generation and time frame <laughs> uh, engagement and proposal and marriage. <laughs> That's we what you're on, supposed to do. She lived in Green home. River. She had moved, her parents had moved to Green River, Utah and I lived in Moab at the time. Yeah. We went on three different dates. I asked her to marry me. We got married nine months later. And you've been married how long now? And now we've been married 36 years. Good for you. Yeah. So, but that would consider That's a fun that, story. Yeah. So it's one of those things that if it hadn't, if, and I can't say that God did this, but if it hadn't been for the 18 months, I wouldn't have met her. My that, mission being cut you, short. You still wouldn't have been home to I see her. I wouldn't have been no. home. Who knows what would have right. happened. And so it, it, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. I think God's hands in it all. Mm -hmm. And with her, she came from a, uh, a Nevada ward, 
and they moved back from Nevada to to Utah, where they had a serious problem with uh, a lesbian leader of the young women oh, in Nevada. In Nevada, oh. and the general authorities came down and threatened her parents with excommunication if they brought it up again. Oh. So she came back from that, and that's why they moved and left Nevada and came back to Utah, was yeah. that reason that they had been threatened. Uh, mm. So we get together, <laughs> and we start you know, comparing notes, for lack of a better term, and find out that we're not, you know, it's not what we were told it was. Mm. And so her parents had started to investigate these uh, fundamentalist groups of Mormons, because even I still believe that the Mormon church was the restored church at the time. Oh, sure. Yeah. And so they started investigating these uh, polygamy, polygamy groups. Polygamy groups, yep. And they mm -hmm. started thinking uh, about joining them, maybe? Or? He was. The dad? Yeah. Well, the dad would. Right. <laughs> so, sorry if I'm I mean, cynical, but yeah. But, no, I, but that's what happened. Yeah. You know, and he, he they, and so we started to listen to some of the stuff they were saying and some of the f stuff they found out. And they got their hands on a bunch of Sandra Tanner's literature oh. and started reading that stuff and passing it down. So I've always... questioning the church. Well, and, and, I, and they, what they did is they came back to a point, and we did too, is we came back to a point that, you know, the church could have been possible to be, the Mormon church could have been the true church 75 years ago. And you work your way all the way back to Brigham Young, and it could have been. And then could you work your way to Joseph Smith, and it could have been. And then right. you realize the more you learn about Mormon history, the stranger it gets. Yeah. It is bizarre. Now, you got married in the temple. Yeah. So was all this happening after the marriage? Yeah, or it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you, she was a good LDS girl and all that yeah. when, when you get And you get married within a year or so yeah, of your mission? Yeah, within a year of, yeah, of okay. returning. And Nine you get months. married where? The Mormon Salt Lake Temple. In the Salt Lake Temple. Yeah, and so we went in there. And now you'd been through the temple before. Had right. she been through? She had never been through before. What did she think of that? Do you remember? Yeah, she was shocked. Well, she yeah. was shocked and dismayed <laughs> would be a good way to put it. Yeah. And one of the things that struck both of us at the time is that after the wedding ceremony where we knelt at the altar and yeah. held hands across the altar and the patriarchal grip and all this stuff yeah. and got sealed, the guy stood up and said, after we stood up, he goes, oh, if you want to exchange rings, go ahead. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And it just kind of floored both of us, you know, and we were like, okay. And she was freaked out from the Mormon temple ceremony and all this stuff. But I have to tell you, funny that happened to me, that how nervous I was. Uh, on the wedding On the wedding day. day okay. No day of wedding. We, uh, my grandmother had some apartments in Spanish Fork. And so... Uh, my wife was to be was staying there, and I was to pick her up. So I was staying in one apartment there, and she was staying in another. And she had a little car, and I went out, and it was we got married December seventeenth. So there was like two feet of snow, <laughs> <laughs> and so I went out, started the car, and then went back in and got bags and everything else, and brought them out, put it in the car, and then went and got her, and we got in the car after a bit of time, and she was ready. We got in the car and drove to the parking lot at the Salt Lake Temple. And I reach up to turn the car off and there's no keys. I'm like, <laughs> where'd the keys go? <laughs> and she had a car where if you started it and didn't lock it, if you started it and didn't pull it all the way back, you could pull the keys out at any point. And so I had left the keys in the trunk. I oh, found the no. keys hanging in the back of the trunk, and they'd survived all the way from Spanish Fork that way. The, and the car's still running. And the car's without, still ru yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I, uh, so we're like, oh, whew, found the keys. You know, get the stuff out of the car, shut the trunk, go into the Mormon temple, get married. And on the way out, I'm feeling my pockets. I don't have the keys to the car. <laughs> They're hanging in the trunk of the car still. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I did it one more time that day. <laughs> I left them hanging in the trunk of the car. So they stayed most of the day in the trunk of the car. Glad they were, <laughs> glad they were honest people there. Or, so, could... or they didn't see, or they didn't want to steal that car, let me tell you. They didn't want to steal that oh, car. Wasn't <laughs> worth, it wasn't, wasn't worth, worth stealing. It. So, oh, yeah, it so did you, so get us to the five years, I guess. Okay. And so we, we got to a point where we were reading I didn't have all of Sandra Tanner's literature, but I had a whole bunch of it, mm -hmm. and I'd read it all. And I've always been to the... And this was all because of her folks 
kind of investigating yep. and looking at things. Did you yep. ever heard any of this stuff before, even on your mission? I had or? never heard any of it before. Yeah, most of it. Well, uh, probably some of it I would have heard, but not. But that, it is shocking, isn't it? It is. It was just absolutely. And, and there's no foundation for it. No. So you don't really have a basis of saying, oh, well, I don't. It's just new. Yeah. It's just new and it's crumbling. One of the things that stuck out in my head at that time yeah, was... Anyway, yeah, absolutely. But one of the things that stuck out in my head at the time were the, where she did the, the differences in the original version of the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. and the modern version. The almost Yeah, almost yeah. 4,000 changes now. Yeah. And people can dismiss that and say, okay, fine. And the minor stuff, I agree. The minor stuff, you could, you know, punctuation and stuff, it was different in the 1800s than it yeah, is today. I, I go but, with that. But there is quite a few verses in there that are totally different. Yeah, doctrinally different. Yes, yeah. and it would make a difference. And so that, that was one of the things that stuck with me in reading that. Right. I always had that belief, I'm sure you did too, that Joseph couldn't move from one word to the next without getting the last one right. Yeah. So how could God be making all these errors <laughs> right and yeah. so it was just a bizarre and you know like because i could attribute like the minor stuff you could attribute to yeah. the the printers and stuff right yeah but the major stuff you'd think that somebody would have checked it right <laughs> but anyhow. so did you keep studying a lot we did i kept i kept reading i read I, re I, I would read anything and everything that anybody gave me and wow. i told them that i wouldn't necessarily agree with it but i would read it and now I, is this I'm, I'm, no, but we're, uh, is this just a few years after your marriage, or this is this right immediate? at, immediately after? Okay, marriage. so this yeah. is a, a while ago. Then. Yeah, as a matter of fact, her father could not come to our wedding because of, he didn't because have a temple recommend. Because he wouldn't. No, he would. He had had one, but he wouldn't go into the Mormon bishop in uh, in Green River where they were living now because they'd moved from Nevada to Green River. He yeah. wouldn't go in there and submit himself. Yeah, because he didn't believe it anymore in reality, oh, okay. and so he didn't attend our so wedding. He didn't get to go there. Yeah, and so this was ongoing. And you know, looking back, we probably shouldn't have got married in the temple. But <laughs> but that's looking back. You don't know. You know, right. we're still well, yeah. we're still hoping or at right. least believing yeah. the church is true, and and this stuff will work out. Right, work and there, out. there'd be an answer somewhere. You know, yeah. there there'd be some some answer somewhere. Where, where was Jesus in your life at this point? And as you reflect back on your mission and your going through the temple, and what was your relationship with God, with Jesus? Uh, he was a remote distance thing that, that I had to obey. Simple as it gets, he was, it was somebody that I had to work to please. Uh -huh. And there wasn't really, to me, there wasn't much of a, a separation between Jesus and God, as in neither one of them really impacted my daily life and neither one of them really mattered. It didn't really make any difference, I was just working. Well, because you're doing it yourself anyway. You know, what do you need them for? Right. If, if, yeah, if I'm just working. You're doing it all for yourself and anyway. And go by Mormon doctrine. His, uh, he didn't atone for all of our sins. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it wasn't... So. Well, and, and you, you've mentioned, I think, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but that Jesus is, in Mormonism, Jesus is... Just a guy. He's a created being. Yeah, he's a created being. He's a guy that just did what he was supposed to do that just God told him to do. came along first. And, yeah, and he, so uh, he happened to be the first, according, it depends on what Mormon version you read, the firstborn of right. this God and his this. one of his wives' spirit babies, right? right? And, and then he was assigned a position yeah. and had to fulfill a thing. He had to die coming down here and die. And so it was important what he did, but not really because I still had to do all this stuff yeah. to even get anywhere. And now as a Christian? It's, the, the huge difference is, <laughs> is, you know, here's a created being, here's somebody who was created, had a point in time start, he, he came into existence, he did, a, did something, did his assignment. and he worked, yeah. versus the Christian God who is always. Jesus, who was uncreated by, never has always been, has never not been, and he paid individually for my sins. Yeah, I mean, there he he came into being. Never, he was always there. Jesus, the, and always God, and always God. And yeah. so, for him to to sacrifice himself on the cross for me, and that's when I became a Christian. Is uh, up to that point, I I knew he had. I'm jumping ahead, though. I knew he. <laughs> I knew he had. I knew he had. Sorry about that. No, it's. I knew he had. 
he had done something for everybody. He had done something for us, Christ, the real yeah. Christ. I knew he had done, but he had never done something for me. It was for us, more of a general thing. Yeah. And when it struck me and finally hit me and the Holy Spirit worked on my heart that he actually did it for me. Yeah. Because he that, loved me. Right, because it was for me, not for you. He may have done it for you, but he did it for me. But isn't that, that is such what we'd call the good news, right? Yeah. This is the gospel of right. Jesus Christ, the, yeah. that he came and loved me, loved you right. individually, and that he's God and was willing to do that. Yeah, and that blows me away, especially knowing who I am. And he knows who I am. A sinner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, I mean, he, he knows who I am, and yet he he came and he died for me. So you must have gone through this study part and then you got mad at God and said, okay, I'm giving up on everything. Is that what happened? I can't, kind of, can't wait to hear it. It kind of did. It yeah. was, we were studying, we are researching. Uh, we actually left the Mormon church and rejoined the Mormon church by our family pressure. Rebaptized? Yeah, we got rebaptized. And then, because we just... Were you excommunicated for we for were not, apostasy? We just, no, we just, were not excommunicated. Just kind of left. Just and, left and, and quit wearing our but Mormon you recommitted underwear, to but we the recommitted church? to it and oh, wow. over family pressure. And because yeah. my mom and dad were devastated. I mean, uh, and so it was, it was really hard. And we, we lived in here in Utah at the time. Mm -hmm. And so we, it was just tough and we just couldn't. So we ended up rejoining for the wrong reasons. We rejoined for pressure, for family pressure. And then we ended up, uh, just couldn't do it. And and then we asked to have our names removed from the records of the church. And back then they wanted to take us through an excommunication ses ses uh, session. To get you to... To get... Because yeah. we were... Because I was a priesthood holder and had gone through the Mormon temple. Melchizedek priesthood. Yeah. yeah. And I refused and told them I would sue them if they didn't just take my names <laughs> off the record. And they, they did. They eventually did. Yeah. They just... They did it. So... And then at that point... God moved us out of Utah for a job. I got a job opportunity in California, and we moved to California at that time. And I became very embittered toward God, and this is where I got mad at Him. And it, and it makes no logical sense at all, but it, it was an emotional sense is what it is. It's how I emotionally felt. Logically, it makes no sense, because I was mad at God because He had betrayed me because the Mormon church was false. <laughs> It's, well, this is yeah. where this is where what happens is we find out the church isn't true. We don't necessarily automatically learn the good news that we just talked about and and have such great love for now, but you just find out the church is true. Yeah. So you, you don't have this other foundation to fall back on. You don't have that relationship. Yeah, and I was I mean I was mad. I mean the the perfect example. I mean I would you know figuratively shake my fist at God and, and curse God because he had lied to me all these years. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't logic, God. It, it wasn't was, God, it but, was but it doesn't make logical sense, right. but it is an emotional response. Yeah. And that's what I was. I was mad at God for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, what brought you around? So, so in California, we could only afford to live in the worst area. We were in Sacramento and the only we could only afford to live in the worst area in Sacramento that you can, you've probably heard of it because of Rush Limbaugh. He makes fun of what area in Sacramento, do you know what I city? Don't, don't. It's called Rio Linda, California. Oh, okay. He makes fun of Rio Linda, oh, California. Okay. And that's where we lived was in Rio Linda. It was a very poor neighborhood and very bad neighborhood. And the, uh, our oldest was five at the time and he was just gonna go into kindergarten. And my wife attempted to take him to kindergarten and found out that the parents were driving up in the morning drunk to kindergarten and the teachers and it was a it was a horrible place it was not a good place and so we we said we couldn't do it and so i convinced her to homeschool oh. and the only way legally in that time to homeschool in california is you had to be part of an umbrella program of a private school Oh, and by and large, back then, the religious, only huh? private schools were Christian private schools. Okay. And so we had to get part of an, um, an umbrella program of a Christian school to homeschool. And so we started looking into the homeschool groups there and found a private school that would accept my wife and I as angry ex-Mormons <laughs> as so we could homeschool. And we started to homeschool, and one of the things that they they reached out to my wife, and this is part of her story, and she can tell it later, another time was, 
they reach out to her and touched her heart because they just started to love her. And so she wanted me to go to, to church with her, to these ladies' churches. And so we went to a couple oh, of That must have been thrilling. <laughs> I was to a point, I was so mad, I was just to a point of, I was just like, okay, fine, I'll go. But just for the family's sake. And it was, we went to some very charismatic churches, which was quite a shock. And yeah. I think I needed it though, because it was so different from the Mormon from what church. you had experienced before. Yeah, and so we went and uh, we attended, attending Christian churches for about 10, 10 to 12 years, depending on how you want to count it, we attended Christian churches. But you sense this uh, worship of Jesus during this time? We, I sensed, my wife sensed it she, more than I Better did. than you did. Yes, <laughs> but in reality, we both came to Christ within about a three month period of time. Really? About like I said, about 10 years later after we left the Mormon church. And we had been attending Christian churches up to that point. Was this kind of a born-again moment, you'd call it? Was. It, what, what it was. Happened? Unfortunately, we're I only know. a few minutes left, but please, if you can, as fast tell as us can. your... So I was, if up to that point, if, you'd, if any of the Christians in those churches would ask me if I was a Christian, I would have said yes. Because I was doing what I, a, Mor a Mormon did, I was doing what a Christian does, so I was a Christian. Because I was yeah. going to church, I was right. doing the Christian thing, so I thought in my mind I was a Christian. And it wasn't until I went to a, we, we went to a different church, and we had moved to Dallas now. Oh. Went to a different church in uh, Dallas, and I was going, I got invited to go to a new Christian's class. And so I decided to go to a new Christian's class. And in that is when I realized that God had not just paid for us, <laughs> He had paid for me, and He loved me enough to do that for me, and not for everybody else, just for me. He took yeah, me yeah. into account, Even and that's yeah. right. And that's when I realized at that point, and that's when I became a Christian. Well, was it a point. moment in time? It or was. Just during it the was, process? It during was a those? moment in time, but if I hadn't had God working on us for that 10 yeah. years, there's no way I could have changed my beliefs as drastically as I have in that time frame. Yeah. And we planted seeds along the way. And right, and we were going, and we were blessed by God because of the churches we were allowed to go to. Like, we were dumb, is to put it as simple. I always say that God's generous to the fools and children, and I wasn't a child at the time. When we moved to Dallas, we didn't know anybody. We literally moved for a job, didn't know anybody. We were driving down the road, and I said, let's go to that church. And half the population of that church was either actively attending Dallas Theological Seminary Oh. Or were spouses of people like actively people attending that, Dallas Theological oh, Seminary. So that's a good group. So to, it was a good group for be yeah. for us to be exposed to. You know, we haven't even mentioned like the Bible. I guess that's taken <laughs> on a little different uh, interest for you. Now. It has. It's it's one of those things that I, for me to trust the Bible, I ended up having to read for probably four years before, and it, so. I know we're really short on time, but there's there's some things you have to do to trust. For me, I had to trust the Bible. I had historically, I had to find out if it was historically accurate, because if it's not historically, which isn't hard to do if you're willing to look, right? right? But, but you, if you if it's not historically accurate, then why do I care? Well, right. It doesn't mean anything. Then it's fiction, right? But a Mormon doesn't even do that, that much, right? Yeah. They? And then you have to find out if it's prophetically accurate, because there's prophecies in there that spans you know thousands of years. Yeah. If and if those fail. Now, just because they're not all, they're all fulfilled yet, doesn't mean that they're yeah. wrong. It just means they're not fulfilled yet. Yeah. So you check to see if it's prophetically accurate. And then I had to check to see if it was cohesive and necessary for life, and meaningful for life. Yeah. Because if those, in my mind, if those things don't take place, I couldn't trust it. And so it took me a period of time to come up to, to a point. To that. And then I was able to. But isn't it joyful? It is. And there's freedom. The guilt's gone. Don't yep. you just It's just a wonderful journey, isn't it? Yeah, and the and the the Bible. It, what's so neat about the Bible is, if studied properly, which yeah. I went through a whole bunch of how to study it properly. If studied properly, it is applicable to our life today. Yeah, and it's not just the messages or the messages, or, but also even just even politically, it's applicable. I mean, if you want to look politically at it, if you want to look at it there, like life for an example. Yeah. You know the the issue, the political issue of life. It's it's directly approaches it. Well, Jeff, I'm sure God has had His hand on your heart and uh, been aware of you and watched over you all these years. I know you probably trust that too. And I'm so grateful you came and shared your story. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll see you next time here on the Ex-Mormon Files.